The ice-cold wind cracks across the caps of the Bighorn Mountains, driving snow into the small valley which is home to the small garrison at Fort Phil Kearney. The wind piles the snow high against the wooden palisades of the fort, almost high enough to walk over. From distant white-capped peaks, Sioux and Cheyenne war chiefs would have eyed the fort below them. Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, Roman Nose, and the leader of the loose confederacy of warriors, Red Cloud. These are the principal leaders who launched a war against the United States late in 1866. With their combined strength, they have entirely shut down travel on the Bozeman Trail and laid tentative siege to the forts along its path in northern Wyoming and into Montana. With their recent victory over Fetterman and his 80 men on December 21, 1866, the Sioux and Cheyenne have effectively created a buffer zone between them and white settlements. Come springtime, many of the bands will travel east in search of buffalo herds and outlying settlements among the Smoke Hill, Republican, and North Platte rivers, but the siege on these forts will remain. Red Cloud has vowed to his warriors to drive the federal troops out of his territory, and it's a promise he intends to keep, no matter how long it takes. The Fetterman disaster shocked and outraged the army. Sherman telegraphed Grant, We must act with vindictive earnestness against the Sioux, even to their extermination, men, women, and children. At the frontier posts, attitudes harden into undiscriminating hostility towards all Indians. Their newspapers called for extermination of the Indians. Some even scored the army for timidity. Railroad and stagecoach interests reinforced Sherman's aggressive designs, Military contractors and freighters joined in the clamor, although army officers recognized their motives as hardly being disinterested. Abandoned for the last five years on the frontier, these settlers suffered the unrelenting warfare of the native tribes. Unhindered by the withdrawn federal troops, the Indians resumed their genocidal raids against their enemies, both American and Indian. Now with the war between the states ended, the U.S. military appeared impotent in its first few attempts to subdue the warring tribes. The Sand Creek Massacre had dramatized the Indian problem to the nation's humanitarian community, mobilizing religious and reform groups and stirring abolitionists in search of a new cause. Members of the East Coast mercantile class, far from the realities of the frontier, used Sand Creek as the linchpin on which to hang the expensive war it ignited on the plains, and gave rise to a peace policy that flowered in the profusion of treaties concluded in the autumn of 1865. Even after the Fetterman disaster, the spirit of conciliation glowed warmly in the Washington offices and eastern parlors. An influential body of opinion held that negotiations in good faith offered a surer means than naked force of bringing peace to the West. Both Secretary of the Interior, Orville H. Browning, and Commissioner of Indian Affairs, Louis V. Boggy, favored sending out peace emissaries to restore harmonious relations and gather data to support a comprehensive program for assembling all Western tribes on reservations. On this and other issues, the Army and the Indian Bureau feuded openly during the winter of 1866-67. to 67. Much of the contention centered on whether licensed traders should be allowed to sell arms and ammunitions to peaceful Indians. Secretary Browning and Commissioner Bogey contended that they were necessary for hunting purposes. The Army, aware that Indians had got along fairly well with bows and arrows for generations, vigorously condemned such sales. General Cook had banned arms sales on the Department of the Platte. In July of 1866, General Hancock, sustained by Sherman and Grant, followed in January of 1867. Both Browning and Bogey regarded this prohibition as the chief cause of Indian hostility, and the Army's intervention not only uncalled for, but unlawful. Bogey complained that his greatest burden was, quote, the constant interference on the part of the military with all Indian affairs, unquote. It was unwarranted and imperious, and unless it were checked, would lead to, quote, nothing less than the destruction of our entire Western settlements and the entire column of Western emigration, unquote. 
Bogey went so far as to attribute the Fetterman disaster to the Army's inhuman denial to Red Cloud's people of the arms necessary for laying in their winter's meat. In a highly imaginative conjecture, he stated, quote, Almost in a state of starving, having made repeated attempts in their conference with Carrington that they might make peace and obtain supplies for their families, and the rescinding of the order prohibiting them from obtaining arms and ammunition, the Sioux were rendered desperate and restored to the stratagem which proved too successful in the past. Unquote. Such fantasy lent color to the charges of the army officers and Westerners that the priest proponents were impractical visionaries. Far better to return the responsibility for Indian management to the War Department and do away with the ambiguous demoralizing division of authority between civil agents and army officers. General Pope, the Army's wordy, self-appointed expert on Indian policy, had publicly championed this move for three years. Both Sherman and Grant officially recommended it in their annual reports in November of 1866. In the wake of Fetterman's annihilation, the time seemed propitious for bringing such a change. Pope wrote an elaborate justification. So did Colonel Eli S. Parker, Grant's Seneca Indian aide, who also drafted a bill that was introduced in the Senate on February 9, 1867. But the idealist peace proponents commanded considerable political strength, and they ticked off an impressive list of Indian outbreaks they accredited to Army blunders. Powerful support for their position came in January 25th, 1867, with the publication of the report of a special joint committee of Congress chaired by Senator James R. Doolittle of Wisconsin. The committee had been formed almost two years earlier as a result of the furor over Sand Creek and had conducted an exhaustive investigation into, quote, the condition of the Indian tribes and their treatment by the civil, military authorities of the United States, unquote. The Doolittle Report piled up a mountain of authoritative testimony showing the fate overtaking the Indian at the hands of the white man, tracing most Indian wars to white aggressions and favoring policies of moderation and conciliation. In the Department of the Platte, General Augur was to organize a striking force of 2,000 cavalry and infantry under Colonel John Gibbon to punish the Sioux and Cheyennes in the Powder River country. Sherman declared, quote, no mercy should be shown these Indians, for they grant no quarter, nor ask for it." Unquote. In the Department of the Missouri, General Hancock was also to form an expedition to show the flag to the Cheyennes and the Kiowas south of the Arkansas River. Reports reaching Hancock suggested that these tribes planned to take the warpath in the spring, and his assignment was to, quote, confer with them to ascertain if they want to fight, in which case we will indulge them. Unquote. Even as he reported his plans, Sherman conceded that Colonel Gibbon's expedition would have to be postponed. General Sully and his fellow commissioners were already in Omaha on their way to talk with the suit. Sherman could hardly avoid instructing Augur not to launch Gibbon until the commission had demonstrated its inability to negotiate the Sioux into submission. No such obstacle blocked Hancock, and in March of 1867, he set forth to contact the Southern Plains tribes. Tall Robust, Hancock presented an appearance that would attract the attention of an army as he passed. He fought superbly in almost every major battle of the Army of the Potomac, but his military career in the East had given him little knowledge of the Indians. The attitudes of the Southern Plains tribes in 1866-67 presented Hancock with the classic dilemma in which the army so often found itself. The principal leaders of the Cheyennes, Arapahoes, Kiowas, and Comanches wanted to avoid trouble with the settlers, even if it meant abandoning some of their historic haunts. Yet these chiefs had no power to restrain the war societies which made up entire bands and sub-bands of their tribes, and it is not above noting that warfare played a fundamental role in many of the southern tribes, most notably the Comanche, the Cheyenne, and the Kiowa. Now the post-war spurt of travel in advance of the railroad added deeply felt grievances to the natural raiding impulse, making the warriors even less amenable to tribal leadership. Edward W. Wincoot, a man whose selling of arms to the Sioux and Cheyenne seemed to have been forgotten in the wake of the Sand Creek Massacre, was now Indian agent for the Cheyennes and Arapahoes, and Jesse H. Leavenworth, Indian agent for the Kiowas and Comanches. They labored to reinforce the chiefs in their pacified efforts. It was in the service of peace 
that both the agents lied in asserting that their tribes were at peace. Almost every tribe contained elements whose behavior belied that assertion. By their menacing attitude, the Cheyenne dog soldiers belied the protestations of the peace chiefs Black Kettle and Little Rogue that the Cheyennes would leave the Smoky Hill Road alone. Their Arapaho allies under Little Raven displayed similar ambivalence. From newly reactivated Fort Arbuckle in Indian Territory came reports that showed the Comanches still raiding in Texas. The commanders at Forts Larned and Dodge, edgy after the Fetterman slaughter, passed on alarmist reports of tribal combinations forming for a general warfare in the early spring. The Kiowas in this neighborhood were badly fragmented. Lone Wolf and Kicking Bird spoke of peace, but what officers on the Arkansas River heard more loudly were the blustering threats of Satanta to drive out the whites altogether if they did not stop running off the buffalo and burning his timber. Complicating the situation still further, bands of Southern Brulee and Oglala Sioux of uncertain disposition had dropped down from the Platte and the Republican to mingle with the Cheyennes and Arapahoes. If the existing threats and raids were allowed to pass unnoticed, they would escalate into trouble of more serious proportions. As Sherman advised Hancock, quote, This cannot be tolerated for a moment. If not a state of war, it is the next thing to it and will result in war unless checked. But as always, how to single out the hostile from the peaceful bands. On March 11, 1867, Hancock advised agents Windcoop and Leavenworth that he intended to lead an army onto the plains to show the Indians that he could whip them if they continued in tormenting the travel routes. He planned to talk with the chiefs. If they wanted war, he would oblige them. If not, they must stay clear of the roads. Quote, we go prepared for war, and we'll make it if a proper occasion presents. No insolence will be tolerated. The command Hancock placed in camp at Fort Larned on April 7th was of suitable impressive dimensions. 1,400 soldiers and 11 troops of the 7th Cavalry, 7 companies of the 37th Infantry, and a battery of the 4th Artillery. The colonel of the 7th was Brevet Major General Andrew Jackson Smith a blunt, irascible old dragoon of almost 30 years' service. Since Smith commanded the district of the Upper Arkansas, the regiment fell to his youthful and flamboyant Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. A major general with his own division at 25 in the Civil War, he now had to content himself with the regiment. Hancock's expedition gave Custer his first experience with the Indians. For the first of Hancock's meetings, Agent Wincoop promised to bring in a delegation of chiefs from a village of Cheyenne dog soldiers and Oglala Sioux reposing on the Pawnee Fork, 35 miles upstream from Fort Larned. A snowstorm and a buffalo herd delayed the meeting five days, and then only two chiefs and a dozen warriors appeared. They were important chiefs, Tall Bull and White Horse, and despite his irritation at the poor showing, Hancock arrayed his officers in dress uniform and held a council. He lectured the Cheyennes sternly, gave them their choice of war or peace, and announced that on the morrow, since the chiefs would not come to him, he would march up the Pawnee Fork to the village and deliver his message to the rest of the chiefs. The next morning of April 13, Hancock embarked up the Pawnee Fork with his 1,400 troops. In the evening, several Cheyenne chiefs, led by Pawnee Killer, met with Hancock to arrange a meeting the following morning. The morning came and went, and nobody came to meet with the general. Later that day, the Cheyenne chief Bull Bear arrived to tell the general that the chiefs were on their way. Irked by the tardiness of the chiefs, Hancock informed Bull Bear that he would move his force closer to the village and convene with the chiefs that night. The peacetime expedition had not gone more than a few miles when they encountered several hundred Sioux and Cheyenne warriors arrayed for war and drawn up in a line of battle. General Hancock reciprocated the gesture and waited for the Indians to make the first move. The two forces crept towards each other until they were within a couple hundred yards. A dozen warriors rode towards the Federals, and Hancock, accompanied by Smith, Leavenworth, Windcoop, and Custer, met them halfway. The general asked them straight up whether they preferred peace or war. The Cheyenne dog soldier, Roman Nose, responded, quote, We do not want war. If we did, 
we would not come so close to your big guns. The general next asked the warriors why they had not come to Fort Larned. Romanos responded first with a lie, saying that his horses were poorly, and followed it up with what is almost undeniably a fact, that every man who had approached him told him a different story as to what Hancock's intentions were. The general told them what he told Bull Bear earlier, that he would continue marching closer to their village to meet with them later that night. Around 5 p.m. that evening, Sioux and Cheyenne chiefs arrived to meet with Hancock and informed him that the presence of so many bluecoats had frightened off their women and children. Hancock informed the chiefs to return to the village and bring their women and children back. Around 9.30, alerted that the men might be getting ready to leave too, he had Custer throw a cordon of cavalry around the village, but the lodges were deserted and the fires smoldering. The Indians had already taken flight. In his dispatches, Hancock wrote, Quote, this looks like the commencement of war, Unquote. The Sioux and Cheyennes hurried north. Custer was sent in close pursuit with eight troops of the 7th Cavalry. Those poor horses that Roman Nose had bemoaned played will-o'-the-wisp with Custer and his troops. The Indians, by scattering into small parties, left the cavalry with no trail large enough to follow. When Custer reached the Smoky Hill Road, he found it a shambles. State stations burned, stock run off, and citizens butchered. Putting in at Fort Hayes before continuing the pursuit, Custer found himself suddenly immobilized. The forage for his horses, thought to have been stockpiled in the fort, had been delayed by high water. Back on Pawnee Fort, Hancock agonized for three days over whether to destroy the abandoned village. He thought the Indians guilty of bad faith in not acceding to his wishes and tried hard to convince himself that their flight was sufficient provocation. Wincoop and Leavenworth argued insistently that the Indians were innocent of any offense and had run solely because they feared another Chivington-like massacre. To burn the village would compound the injury already done and make war certain. General Smith agreed, and before Hancock's decision could be swayed, a courier from Custer detailing the death and destruction on the Smoky Hill, with Custer's report confirming his suspicions, Hancock concluded, quote, I am satisfied that the Indian village was a nest of conspirators, unquote. On April 19th, over Wincoop's forceful protest, he put a torch to 111 Cheyenne Lodges, 140 Sioux Lodges, and immense quantities of camp equipage. Hancock and his force continued on to Fort Dodge and Larned to further deliver his ultimatum to the Arapaho and Kiowa chiefs from camps south of the Arkansas River. Satanta, the unpredictable Kiowa war leader, seemed so sincerely devoted to peace that Hancock presented him with a Major General's dress uniform. Reaching Fort Hayes on May 2nd, he found Custer still paralyzed by the want of forage. As soon as the grass grew greener, Hancock directed, Custer was to take the field. Quote, War is to be waged against the Sioux and Cheyenne Indians between the Arkansas and the Platte. Unquote. With that, the department commander repaired to Fort Leavenworth. During May and June, the Sioux and Cheyennes waged their war between the Arkansas and the Platte. They struck repeatedly at mail stations, stagecoaches, wagon trains, and railroad workers on the Platte, the Smoky Hill, and the Arkansas. The progress of the rail construction slowed, and for a time stagecoaches on the Smoky Hill quit running altogether. Satanta repaid Hancock's generosity by flaunting his new uniform while running off the stock herd at Fort Dodge. In the remote western Kansas, Fort Wallace endured constant harassment, and its garrison skirmished several times with Cheyenne war parties. With six troops of the 7th Cavalry, about 300 men, Custer set forth on June 1st to search out the hostiles along a thousand-mile swath to the Platte, the Republican, and back to the Smoky Hill. Inconclusive clashes with Sioux warriors marked his progress. After patrolling north to Fort McPherson on the Platte River in Nebraska, he and his men headed south to the forks of the Republican River. During their patrol, the troops saw smoke signals during the day and flaming arrows at night, but did not engage in hostilities. In the meantime, General William T. Sherman, commanding the forces at Fort Sedgwick, wanted to send messages to Custer and dispatched 25-year-old Lieutenant Lyman S. Kidder 
of Company M, 2nd Cavalry, to find Custer and to give him these messages. Headed to where Custer and his men were believed to be encamped, on the forks of the Republican River, some 90 miles southeast of Fort Sedgwick, Kidder, along with a 10-man patrol and a Sioux Indian guide named Red Bead, left the fort on June 29th. Kidder reached Custer's campsite on the evening of July 1st, but found it abandoned. Unbeknownst to Fort Sedgwick, Custer had left the area, scouting further south than northwest. In the moonlight, Kidder mistook a trail of a wagon train that Custer had sent to Fort Wallace for Custer's own trail. He and his men then followed the wrong path. About noon the next day, a group of Lakota Indians discovered Kidder's party north of Beaver Creek, a tributary of the Republican River. The Lakota then alerted several nearby Cheyenne Indians, and the warriors approached the soldiers. Seeing the Indians, Kidder and his troops veered off to the southeast, making for the valley of Beaver Creek. As they fled, some of the soldiers were shot down on the ridge above the creek, but the rest made it to the defensive position in a small gully about 50 yards north of the creek. However, the Lakota dismounted and crept up on foot while the Cheyenne circled the gully. Though the soldiers fought fiercely, killing two Indian horses, they were hopelessly outnumbered. Kidder and all his men and the Lakota scout were killed, some having been taken alive and tortured before their deaths, and their bodies mutilated and burned. Two Lakota were also slain in the foray, including Chief Yellow Horse. In the meantime, Custer, having received no word from General Sherman, began to move his troops towards Fort Sedgwick. He telegraphed the fort for new orders upon arriving at Riverside Station some 40 miles to the west. He learned that he had missed the Kidder Patrol, and concerned for their safety, he left immediately and headed back south. They first came upon a dead army horse on the trail, then signs of a running battle for a few miles along Beaver Creek. On July 12th, they found the decomposed bodies of Kidder and his party in a ravine north of Beaver Creek. Bodies had been badly mutilated and all had been scalped except the Indian guide. Custer would write in his book, My Life on the Plains, quote, Each body was pierced by some 20 to 50 arrows, and the arrows were found as the savage demons had left them, bristling in the bodies, unquote. Custer pushed his command to exhaustion, and troopers deserted by the score. The column dragged into Fort Wallace on July 13th, with horses unfit for further campaigning. On August 1st, 1867, P.S. Ashley and a crew of six men were surveying the route for the Union Pacific Railway when they were attacked by a group of 30 Cheyenne warriors. All six railroad workers were killed but one man named William Gould survived and was brought to Fort Hayes, Kansas, where he told his story before also succumbing to his wounds. At that time, one of Fort Hayes' main functions was to protect the railroad workers and Captain Henry Corbin, commanding the 38th Infantry and 10th Cavalry, known as the Buffalo Soldiers, immediately ordered Captain George Arms, Company F, 10th Cavalry, in pursuit of the Cheyenne. George Arms and his men followed the trail and were soon sent back to the fort for reinforcements. However, after waiting for four hours, the anxious men continued the pursuit before the reinforcements arrived. Some 25 men of the 38 Infantry, under the command of Sergeant Pittman of Company C, were sent out to reinforce the 10th Cavalry. Following the trail up the North Fork of the Big Creek, northeast of Fort Hayes, they encountered a small band of 50 Cheyenne warriors and, with three shells from a howitzer, succeeded in scattering the Indians, but doing minor damage. When they found no signs of Captain Arms and his men, the 38th Infantry returned to Fort Hayes. In the meantime, Arms had followed the trail up the Saline River and about 25 miles northwest of Fort Hayes. They were surrounded and attacked by some 400 Cheyenne warriors. Arms quickly ordered his men to dismount and fight on foot, and the soldiers found themselves surrounded. Outnumbered, Arms then ordered his men to form a compact defensive maneuver by forming a hollow square around the cavalry horses, and began to march toward Fort Hayes. The battle raged for six hours as the Buffalo soldiers fought off their attackers. When the soldiers were about ten miles north of Fort Hayes, the Cheyenne broke off the attack. During the thirty hours the troops had been gone, they had marched 113 miles without rations, fifteen of those miles while under attack. Although 2,000 rounds of ammunition had been fired during the battle, casualties were surprisingly light. 
with only six Indians and one soldier, Sergeant William Christie, killed. Christie was the first combatant death in the 10th Cavalry. Arms would later say of the battle, quote, It is the greatest wonder in the world that my command escaped being massacred. Unquote. For the rest of the summer, Indian warriors ran wild on the Arkansas, Smoky Hill, and Platte Rivers. Agents Leavenworth and Wincoop protested that their tribes had sought peaceful refuge south of the Arkansas, and each ascribed the continuous hostilities to the other's Indians. In truth, the peace elements of all tribes had gone south of the Arkansas, but the war factions had stayed north of the river to enjoy a raiding season as exciting and profitable as that of 1864. The inability of troops to prevent headline-making raids on stage stations and coaches and railroad workers aggravated another problem that plagued Sherman. The governors of Kansas, Colorado, Montana bombarded him and his superiors with appeals for authority to call out the volunteers to help the regulars. Sherman thought that nothing complicated an Indian war as undisciplined volunteers riding about the countryside in search of Indians. A.C. Hunt and Samuel J. Crawford, governors of Colorado and Kansas, pressed their case with fervor. Sherman succeeded in fending off Hunt, but Crawford, with powerful aid from Senator Edmund G. Gross in Congress and the Sioux and Cheyennes raiding on the Smoky Hill, at last won the general's reluctant consent. In mid-July, the 18th Kansas Volunteer Cavalry, a 353-man battalion, was mustered into federal service. It performed credible work in helping the regulars patrol the travel routes, and on August 22nd through 23rd, two troops participated with a troop of the 10th Cavalry in a major action on Beaver Creek with several hundred Sioux and Cheyennes. On August 20th, 1867, the 18th Kansas Volunteer Cavalry left Fort Hayes for the headwaters of the Solomon and Republican Rivers. On the evening of the 21st, Captain George B. Jennis of Company C was sent out with a detachment to ascertain the cause of a light seen at some distance across the prairie. He found the remains of an old Indian campfire, but when he attempted to return to his regiment, he became confused in the darkness and finally decided to camp on the open prairie. Early the next morning, he reached the river about eight miles below the soldiers' camp. Upon reaching the river, he pushed on towards the troops, but after going about three miles, his detachment was attacked by a large body of Kiowa and Southern Comanche Indians. Forming a hollow square, which had proved so effective during the Battle of the Saline River earlier that month, he managed to hold the warriors at bay. His men were armed with Spencer repeating carbines, and each man carried 200 rounds of ammunition, so they were well equipped with a heroic defense. After a short skirmish, Captain Jennis again began to move up the river toward the camp, but after going about half a mile, he saw more Indians. He then returned to the river and threw up a breastwork of driftwood and loose stones, behind which his little band fought valiantly for three hours. All the horses except four were either killed or wounded. Two of his men were killed and twelve seriously wounded. The detachment withdrew to the ravine, where they found water and remained under cover of the willows and the banks of the ravine until dark. The Indians then drew off, and Janus and his men, under the guidance of a scout, followed a buffalo path for five miles until they came to the river. The Indians renewed the attack the next morning, but the main command came to Janus's rescue. Except for his initiative and Custer's abortive expedition, Hancock's forces spent the summer in a strictly defensive duty. For Kansas, Colorado, and Indian Territory, Hancock counted the equivalent of two and one-half regiments of infantry, elements of the 3rd, 6th, 37th, and 38th, plus the 7th and 10th Cavalry, the last not yet fully organized. Little more than 4,000 officers and men held 18 forts and camps and guarded more than 1,500 miles of major travel arteries. All the regiments struggled under a heavy burden of untrained recruits, and to make matters worse, all were continuously decimated that summer by desertion and cholera, both of epidemic proportions. Not surprisingly, they failed to secure every target the hostiles might elect to hit. On August 26, 1867, General Winfield S. Hancock was transferred by order of President Andrew Johnson to replace General Philip Sheridan as commander of the 5th Military District encompassing Louisiana and Texas. 
General Philip Sheridan was a Union war hero, the North's greatest cavalryman, but as an administrator, an absolute failure. Just as Hancock would replace Sheridan as commander of the 5th Military District, so Sheridan would replace Hancock in the Department of Missouri. Major General Philip Henry Sheridan lacked the gentlemanly polish of Hancock. A short, stout Irishman with piercing eyes and a black mustache, 36 and a bachelor, he combined pugnacity in official intercourse with reserve in all but intimate social intercourse. In the latter, he would be witty and fun-loving. An English nobleman, the Earl of Dunraven, found him, quote, a delightful man with one peculiarity of using the most astounding swear words quite calmly and dispassionately in ordinary conversation, unquote. Scarcely less revered by his troops than Sherman, Little Phil was a brilliant combat leader, attentive to the wants of his men and in a fight always on the front. He gloried in a Civil War record that left him excelled in popular affection only by Grant and Sherman. Alert, observant, and energetic, he owed his repeated battlefield triumphs to audacity coupled with a perfect indifference as to how many of his men were killed. He identified the objective and went for it by the most direct means and without much respect for the conventions of civilized warfare. With Sherman, he subscribed to the doctrine of total war, of subjecting a whole enemy's population to the horrors of war and thereby undermining the will to resist.